Hey gang, this is Chet Womack here from theprepperproject.com and I'm excited because today I have Scott Hunt with us and we've brought Scott on board to work with us with a project for you guys and that is about how you can protect yourself from an EMP event or a CME event and for those of you that, that don't know what those events can do and some of their risks and, and if you're even able to protect yourself from them or not, I thought we'd put together a couple of little questions for you that that could help educate you and teach you about whether this is an issue that you would like to add to your preparedness plan. So Scott, how real is the threat of an EMP or a CME? Those two events are very real and within the subset of EMP, it, there's a lot of things that can cause an EMP. It can be a localized EMP, it can be a naturally caused EMP, it could be from a terrorist attack, it could be somebody launching a satellite and detonating a satellite, or maybe a rocket and that is detonated at an atmosphere, say above 25 miles above the United States. That can cause tremendous uh, destruction. These things have been tested in history. Starfish Prime is an example I refer to a lot. The Carrington events, an event that has happened in our, in our history. So they're real events. They're, uh, there's excellent scientists behind the scenes that have done studies their whole life on what an EMP can do uh, to a modern society. A first world country can be absolutely wiped out if the grid is just taking the grid down and both a CME and a nuclear EMP can do both of those things. Nuclear EMP, a little more intense, can take out electronics, line of sight, gamma ray induced EMP is taking out our, all of our critical electronics. So they're, they're both real, um, they've both been studied extensively and they're real threats to our society. So when you talk about rockets or satellites, what does that mean? How many, how many countries could pull off a potential EMP attack if it were to be an attack no. that are out there? We know of at least three that could pull that off. If, if it was against us, there's at least five countries that could do it. We could do it, Israel could do it, Russia, China, North Korea. And that's why we're watching Iran because they could definitely pull that off soon if they're being aided by whether it's North Korea, China, or Russia. So, and they've basically made those comments through to the world that they could would like to wipe us off the face of the map along with Israel. So that is really, that is, that is proven. You don't have to be accurate with this kind of weapon. You just have to launch it into the atmosphere and detonate it. You can detonate it from a cell phone. So this is something that is, uh, that hopefully our intelligence agencies and our country is looking into to thwart that. So that's one of the ways to mitigate an EMP attack is to have great intelligence basically knocking down their ability to do what is very simple to do. And that's, so that's, that's what we need to be working on as well as protecting the grid in case an event does happen. Can we harden it? Just like our military um, equipment is hardened to some level against an EMP so that you know our military, our service members can fight during a nuclear event. Well, how can they do that? Because their equipment's been protected or hardened against an EMP. We just need to take what we've learned from the military and apply it to our civilian infrastructure. So once we know a CME is happening or an EMP attack uh, is, is really maybe very possible, is there anything that we can do to prevent the, the damage from affecting us in our, in our homes or properties or maybe our neighborhoods? It's a great question and I like to always separate CME away from the nuclear EMP because a nuclear is such a fast event that you're really not going to be able to do anything to stop that. I mean the only thing our military could do is actually stop that rocket, that missile, that satellite before it is launched. The higher it gets the more dangerous it becomes and so being able to stop it quick, you know, that's one thing that can be done. Uh, what can we do? Um, we can, if it's a CME, we can find out through early detection systems, email, phone calls, text messages can be sent to you by NASA, Space Weather uh, Center, Goddard Space Institute. There's a lot of um, uh, apps that are out there today that can warn you of an um, Earth-directed CME. And that gives you time to do a couple things. Throw your critical devices in a Faraday cage, disconnect, unplug from the grid. You can do that. Then um, for a nuclear, there's really not much you can do. If it's going to be, it's going to be an unknown event, except for pre -prepa preparing for these, this event by protecting your critical devices, putting them in what is called a Faraday cage, and, um, and test, making sure that's, that's tested. And there's some basic rules of 
thumb and guidelines to make these Faraday cages to protect your critical devices. So you can do something while the politicians are delaying, there's stuff that we can do. Now there are people that are working on at a state level, local level, to try to harden the grid and I think that's great and they should be supported as well ways to basically take that pulse that's coming down the grid and shunt that to ground before it destroys that transformer that takes a year to replace. So there's, to me, at least three levels. There's our military intelligence, there's engineering being done to protect our grid, harden it from an EMP, and then what can we do as an individual? We shouldn't be overwhelmed, throw up our hands and do nothing because there's some very simple things that were proven in the 1800s that will stop an EMP. So Scott, what are the effects on human life? I've, I've seen some certain scary studies, I don't know if they're true, on, on, on die-off rates, on, on casualty counts. You know, how, how bad could an event like this really I, be? Yeah, I, it could be bad, not because of the EMP itself. Biologically, the studies are that it would, you know, it's a radio, it's a high energy radio wave that's gonna go right through us and not affect us, for the most part. The, um, the problem is our critical infrastructure, our water, systems, uh, delivery of food, telecommunication, our financial systems, everything is interdependent, the internet, uh, navigation, travel, transportation systems, everything that we know of is, is, is relying on electricity. So if the grid goes down, people will die off, people that are on respirators, um, you know, backup systems will run out of fuel eventually and you won't, won't be able to resupply it. So people will be hungry, um, people will be overreacting, there will be a lot of um, there will be a lot of uh, life lost. I don't know. There's all sorts of predictions. There's been books written about it. You know, 90% within a year. Those kinds of scary numbers. But uh, we're pretty resilient. We'll come back. But in the problem is just we're so dependent upon everything that we take for granted today: our water, our food, our shelter, our heating, cooling. Um, so we live in places that people wouldn't live in before. Harsh environments that, um, you know, exposed to those environments and not being able to regulate your body temperature for over three hours, you're not going to make it. And so places, you know, you know where they are. I mean, people vacation there. People have moved there from a colder climate or maybe you live in a very cold climate and you can't stay warm. It's, you're going to have die-off rate just from that. And then people that are compromised with their health can't get the pharmaceuticals they need. They're on life-sustaining medications. Um, go, uh, you know, diabetics, uh, insulin-dependent folks um, that cannot you know get their insulin they're not going to be doing well within days so there's a lot of factors we are so dependent upon electricity you remove electricity and you remove life scott one of the reasons we reached out to you and wanted to bring you on and do a project with you is because you were involved in some government task forces involved with dealing with these issues. Can you tell us about that? I can tell you a little bit about it. I was very fortunate to be a part of a, a group of people, some engineers and businessmen that were very concerned about just this. The concern started with individual preparedness about protecting their families from the effects of an EMP. And then it grew to a broader, how can I protect my state? How can we protect the country? And so there was a, a, a project, it was called the NOAA Projects, plural. You can find this out at thenoaprojects.com. And so I was fortunate to be an engineer as part of the task force. How can we make an EMP proof or EMP resistant community mm -hmm. where people could come and what do we have to do to do that? So a lot of people from different skill sets were brought in. Um, Dr. Peter Pry uh, from Impact America, Cynthia Ayers that worked with the Department of Defense. Uh, there were people um, like, um, and other resources outside of that, Dr. Arthur Bradley's a great resource for information on EMP and CME. Then there are folks that actually do this for the military. Um, there's Jackson Engineering, Randy White's been a great resource there. They build Faraday enclosures for the military so they're able to, you know, protect from, help um, our military greatly. So being a part of this task force, I've learned a lot. And there was people like Chuck Manto from Academia. So you had military, academia, and people that are have the, the uh, physics background, the en electrical engineering background. From my standpoint as a mechanical engineer, I came to the, my, my thing was to come to this task force to give solutions that were EMP proof. They did not rely on electricity. So that's kind of always been my angle. How can I mitigate an EMP? Well, the simple thing is I don't, want to put in anything that requires electricity. That's the easiest thing to do. So I am fond of going back into the 1800s and early 1900s and finding technology 
that will decentral or you know basically you make your own power at your location you take care of your own food supply water supply and there's so many ways to do that mechanically that you don't have to make some sophisticated electrical system EMP proof just make a mechanical system that has been proven but we're so we're so uh, decentralized and we don't want to do anything local and so th that was my goal with this task force that was my part my contribution to the task force like how can I get water out of the ground mechanically well there's a lot of ways to do that from hand pumps to old mechanical ram pumps that have been around since the late 1700s how can I run a generator off of a biomass for instance how can I use heat and uh, to thermal siphon and produce hot water with a natural convection. So there's a ton of mechanical solutions that can help people have a uh, normal life through a CME and allow them to focus. Maybe you have to focus more on defending your location than you have to, you're not worried about, can I stay clean? So the things like sanitation and, and those kinds of things, that's what I brought to the table was forget the electrical, let's focus on the mechanical things that have worked, they've worked for years and years, let's do those things. And so we implemented a lot of those, I continue to implement many of those ideas today to, to mitigate the EMP threat. And speaking of those types of projects, let's just tell people about some of them that we've been doing as we've been working together. Oh yeah, to Show great. people how to do themselves. Right. Well, part of this project, what we did is we installed a hand pump, for instance. And I, we can, you can install a hand pump in any commercial well, hand dug well, it doesn't matter. You know, if you have a water source that's underground and you want to get that water source out, that's easy to do. And a lot of people, one of the things I want to clear up, and people say, well, I can't do that. You know, my well is so deep. It's 200 foot deep. It, it, yes, you can. These are deep well hand pumps, unlike what you're used to. It's not grandma, grandma's pitcher pump to get that would only get water from 25 feet below the surface. We've gone down to 350 feet with a hand pump and extracted potable water that could keep you alive. So those are, that's one of the projects we worked on. We looked at the ram pumps for mechanically delivering water, massive amounts of water every day for gardening. Um, you know, and I, you know, just storing, we talked about storing water. You know, everybody that's drinking water today can store that water to get them through a crisis. So we've done a lot of mechanical things on this project to help you to um, basically um, have a be able to survive in style that you can still have water you can have pressurized water and you can have hot water through we look we made a thermal siphoning system mm -hmm. that can heat water into a temporary tank that can be stored for later use and you can tie that in with your home and so there's a lot of things you can use whether it's biomass solar mechanical hand generators there's a lot of things that you can do to give you a, a peace of mind so don't just do nothing <laughs> you know don't be overwhelmed by EMP when there's a lot of solutions that we can show you so if you would like to learn more about how to protect yourself from these types of EMP or CME events with mechanical solutions and even more advanced solutions for protecting electronics head on over to homeimprovement.com where we can show you all the projects that we can teach you how to do to keep you safe